Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 140 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Terry Tatchell. She was nominated for an Oscar for her work on District 9, which she co-wrote with her husband, director Neil Blomkamp. They also work together on the new film Chappie, about a police robot that becomes sentient and must learn to survive on the mean streets of Johannesburg. And now, here's our interview with Terry Tatchell. All right, so we're here with Terry Tatchell. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Excited to be here. Okay, and so this new film is called Chappie. So how did you guys come up with the idea? Well, Neil actually came up with the idea, and uh, we live in this house where we're kind of constantly pitching ideas nonstop. Everyone wakes up with a different idea. Our daughter pitched songs. We pitch story ideas. And usually they're good. They're interesting. But this one, the second he told me the idea, it struck me as it's absolute gold and something that I had to work on with him. Okay. And so what, and so what is the idea? Um, the, well, the idea that he pitched me was that um, a, a robot is become sentient, basically childlike, and has to grow and evolve, and is kidnapped by gangsters. Yeah, yeah. And so your list is the co-writer on this movie. So could you just tell us a bit about what exactly your role was and how your collaboration works? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, Neil, we're we're married, so um, it's not. It's probably not as traditional as some writing partners. Like we sort of uh, mostly just throw ideas back and forth. But uh, the the I suppose the odd thing is, is we we wrote District Nine together, and because we were married, we we decided it wasn't a good idea. So we wrote District Nine together and said we'd never ever ever work together again. We far preferred a happy house and leave work at the door. And then when this idea came up, I said no no let's 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 rethink this because I think I could bring a lot to the story. And he he agreed, but we set ground rules. So we didn't ever talk face-to-face about the script. We only emailed back and forth. Yeah, and so when you say that you, you thought you could bring a lot to the script, sort of, was was there a particular aspect of it that you focused on, like the dialogue or the yeah. characters? Or... I mean, Neil, Neil uh, is very visual and uh, very instinctive. And I'm very, uh, I'm very character-driven. Uh, I love, I love, love, love delving into characters, their arcs, and and the realism of their choices. And um, I'm also, I can be a bit of a structure geek, like figuring out what the structure should be, where to break it, uh, having fun with that. So he is, um, I think he's a little more. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't want to put myself down, but I'd say <laughs> I'd say he's the more the genius between the ideas and the just the craziness of everything and. And I kind of bring the, uh, the, the, the logic to it. I don't know if that's the right word, but, but yeah, no. So we definitely have our different areas that we excel at. And I also, um, I think I, ha- I am able to bring a lot of heart to it in a different way that he brings heart to things. So given that it's, I don't know, I'm a mother, it's a childlike robot, uh, there, I think that this script had, um, it, it had the potential for having a, a, a touch of a mother to it that other scripts may not. Well, yeah. So tell us about the character of Chappie. Just how did you go about developing that character? And you know, how did you make of this robot sort of this likable, believable character? I, I've, I've heard writers say, I mean, you always hear novelists say, oh, the characters write themselves. And I always think, yeah, whatever. You're full of it. <laughs> and I have to say, I might be a believer now because, and I don't know, like, we wrote Chappie a while ago. We wrote Chappie before Neil shot Elysium. So in my mind, I don't know if it's because we've been through so much with it now and it's been shot and it's, it's a finished film, but I feel like Chappie already existed. I just feel like Chappie is Chappie. We didn't, the characters, other characters, we had to fine tune and tweak and think about, you know, how they'd be perceived by the audience. But literally from first draft, Chappie was Chappie, exactly as he is. There, Chappie didn't undergo any changes at all. So, um, yeah, he, he was easy. He, I guess I hate to be cliche, but he really did write himself. And I know that the character is portrayed on screen by actor Charlotte Copley, who was also in District 9 and Elysium. Did he sort of improv stuff? Did he shape the character in any way? 
Um, in this film, Neil opted not to have any improv. So the dialogue on the screen is 100% what was written on the page. However, Charlto's, I mean, I'd watch, I was there for the first week of photography and then I had foolishly just opened a restaurant a week before we started shooting in Vancouver. So I had to be back in Vancouver for it. And, but I'd watch the dailies every day and I would get so excited when I'd see Charlto being chappy because his expressions, his movements, his, the way he delivered the lines, that was just pure gold. And uh, he brought Chappie, uh, he brought a vulnerability to Chappie that I don't think I'd imagined in my head that, uh, that although the lines weren't improvised, he, he definitely brought something to the character that, that I couldn't have conceived. Yeah, yeah. And so did you guys do any sort of research into robotics to, to write this movie? Well, the good thing with working with Neil and I together is we have completely different interests and expertise. I I studied a lot of developmental psychology, so he didn't have to look into that. And Neil, just anything that comes out about AI or robotics, he immediately devours it, and it's in his brain forever. So knowing that, uh, I, I no, I didn't. I mean, aside from having dinner with him, and every time something new comes out, he tells me so i just know it but no i knew i i knew i didn't have to touch that in co-writing with him well it's interesting because I, I think this film is set in 2016 but these are very advanced robots i mean how how soon do you actually think we'll see robots this advanced uh, in real life that's funny do you know that i've i mean i've watched the uh i've watched the film so many times now and i didn't know it was set in 2016 um yeah, I uh, well, I, I, I've been only in the last week since people have been asking me all these interesting questions about robotics and telling me about robots that uh, we were just in Berlin and there are lap dancing robots in Berlin. Hmm. There's three lap dancing robots that you can go and and so of course I had to search them and see and uh, I I don't know about the AI but the actual uh, what robots are capable of is uh, a lot more advanced than I thought it was. I mean, and that's what, just what we're seeing, what's out there. So uh, who knows what's being done behind closed doors? But uh, to me, Chappie is 100% a work of fiction. I, uh, I, I, don't, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Yeah, and it looks like one of the big themes in this movie is autonomous robots versus uh, human-controlled robots. Do you have, and, and especially the uh, autonomous police robots, do you have any opinion on that sort of an issue? Um, I mean, it's definitely, it's come up in conversation a lot. Um, I am the furthest from the expert on that kind of thing. And and even Neil's opinions on the topic have changed since we wrote. So he's always telling me his different thoughts and showing me graphs and charts. And I know the flavor of the month is to be dreading this and thinking that it's terrifying. But I intend to run around with rose-colored glasses on. And if 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 they are that smart and that I mean, Chappie, the whole thing with Chappie to me is how humane he is, despite the fact that he isn't human. And I would like to believe that if there is a superior intelligence, that uh, behaving humanely would be a more intelligent way to be. So I, I don't know. I tend to I tend to be optimistic about it. Well, I mean, since this is a show for science fiction fans, obviously one of the biggest names in robots in science fiction is Isaac Asimov. I'm just curious if you guys were influenced by him at all. Um, I can't speak for Neil, uh, when, because Neil and I email back and forth and we don't ever talk about this face to face. Um, and, and Neil doesn't speak about themes and he doesn't think about, he, he, he so, so I, I, I can't speak for him, but for me, I was probably coming at it. And this is like the worst thing I can say on a science fiction, uh, uh, podcast, but I really was coming at it more from the fairy tale side of things. Neil is the science fiction guy, and I am more the uh, I'm more the fairy tale person, which I think is what makes Chappie unique. I mean, we we like fantasy and science fiction on this show. I mean, could you say a bit more about the fairy tale aspects? I mean, how how do you see this as a fairy tale? Um, well, I don't want to ruin it for anybody, but I mean, it's definitely and, and Neil and I disagree on this horribly but um to me it's an r-rated fairy tale i mean it it's an in it's, it's it's an inanimate object that that's being given a soul and for good or for bad and to me that magic and wonder is straight out of the fairy tale and the r-rated side of it is 
you know, dates back to the original fairy tales where you get to be brutal and violent and uh, terrifying with it. So to me, it's, it's the best kind of fairy tale. All right, yeah, but let's talk about the, the cast of this movie because it's got a really impressive cast, uh, including some real-life rappers from South Africa, right? Uh, tell us about that. <laughs> Ah, Ninja and Yolandi, they are, they, I mean, we wrote it as them. It, it was, it, Ninja and Yolandi were right from the get-go. In fact, when Neil first pitched me the idea, it was Ninja and Yolandi. So um, it's, it's always been them. But um, I guess what I couldn't have appreciated was how incredible they are. Uh, they, 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 every moment on screen is, to me, captivating. Yolandi is just this, insane, wonderful mix of this maternal uh, femininity, yet at the same time dangerous, and, and brains. She's like the brains of, of, of their whole lair. And Ninja is Ninja, Ninja's one of my favorite characters in the film. I feel like he's the one who changes the most in the film. And he is, you just want to hate him. You just can't stand him. But by the end of the film, I think everyone everyone is rooting for him and loving him. And that, that's my favorite kind of character. And he is so funny and so, you can't take your eyes off him when he's on the screen. Really, really, really good. Yeah, and I read that both of them have the letters, the letters D9 tattooed on their inner lips as a reference to District 9. <laughs> the first time I met uh, Ninja and Yolandi was they were playing in Vancouver at the Commodore. And we watched the show, and then we went backstage to meet them. And uh, and yes, I did. I had heard that they had D nine tattooed in their lips, but uh, it was I saw it. it they they did have D nine in their lips. But someone told me since then that if you get a tattoo in your lip, it's not forever. That that the tissue in your lip for whatever pushes the the ink out or whatever a tattoo is. So I, whether it, if it's still there or not, I don't know. But Yolandi did get a chappy tattoo on her arm before the film was greenlit, and that that added a little bit of bit of uh, pressure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then in the trailer, I also saw there's a cameo by the newscaster Anderson Cooper. And uh, I don't know, I'm a, I'm a big news junkie. I'm just kind of curious. How do you select? How do you get newscasters like that to appear in the movie? Do you have a list of them, or like how did that work? No, it was, I mean, we wanted Anderson Cooper for sure. Um, I thought it was a long shot. I didn't think it was going to happen. And I think it was Simon Kimberg, the producer, who managed to make that happen. And that was an exciting day. I was, it just, I mean, it's such a crazy film. And I love moments like that, that sort of grounded in reality. And uh, he comes on fair, fairly close to the beginning of the film and just sets everything up. And, and I, I, once that got added into the edit, I, I, I yeah, it, it makes the intro, I think. Uh, and also Sigourney Weaver's in this movie. How did she get involved? Uh, she, that was a, that was a last minute thing too. I, I don't know if, um, I mean, we always, I mean, we, we have an African gray parrot at home called Ripley. So let's, let's, let's put it that way. We huge alien fans, huge Sigourney Weaver fans. And, had we known when we were writing that role that she was going to play it, I think it probably we would have, she, she doesn't have enough time in the film, uh, given her talents and how amazing she is. Uh, so it was, uh, she was the last one. I think it was a week before we started shooting that we found out for sure that it was going to be Sigourney. So does she know that you have a parrot named Ripley? Oh, Neil told her. I was like, don't, don't tell her that. She's going to think we're weird stalkers. <laughs> but yes, yeah, she does know. She very kindly hasn't really brought it up with me. So I don't seem like such a stalker. We'll just pretend that uh, Neil named the parrot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, great. And so, I mean, you know, obviously there are a lot of movies about robots out there. Uh, could you say, like, what are some of your favorite science fiction movies featuring robots? And did any of them have any particular influence on this movie? Oh, Iron Giant. I love Iron Giant. That is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite movies. Um, and I think that, well, I don't think it influenced the writing. I think it's, it's a robot that, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, it's, a, it's an alien robot, but it's, it's not, I feel like hanging up and going and watching it. I love it so much. <laughs> it's a kind robot that is misjudged, and it's, it's a humane robot. So I guess I hadn't thought of it until right this minute, but yeah, there probably was a little bit of influence there because I love that film. Love it. <laughs> um, all right, well, so you mentioned uh, that Sigourney Weaver uh, 
you mentioned Sigourney Weaver in the movie. You mentioned Alien, uh, and uh, it's been in the news recently that Neil is going to be doing a, a, an Alien movie. Uh, is there anything you can tell us about that? Oh, no, he'd kill me. <laughs> <laughs> All I can say is that we can't even go through uh, customs without someone saying, hey, tell me about this Alien movie. Yeah, it, it certainly exploded. He posted some images one night, uh, some art that he'd been having done for some ideas. He put them on Instagram, and the next thing you knew, the Internet exploded. And uh, I'm shocked at what a big deal it is and how many people, uh, how many people love those movies. So yeah, it's been it's been pretty uh, it, it's I, it's I, I don't know if it's a good thing for Chappie or a bad thing for Chappie, but it's definitely been a topic of conversation. Yeah, yeah. All right. So while I was uh, researching this movie, I came across a couple of Neil Blomkamp quotes. I was kind of curious maybe to get your reaction to some of these. Um, <laughs> oh, this sounds fun. <laughs> okay, so one of them is uh, he says most films don't carry much intellectual weight; they're fluff. And of science fiction movies, he says science fiction authors do it much better. Uh, so what do you think about that? Hmm. I, th I think that Neil is, I've known Neil for 13 years now, and his one thing I love about him is that he's constantly evolving and growing and changing his opinions. And I think that if he heard that quote right now, he would perhaps uh, find it a bit, I, I don't think he'd be so quick to put down all the science fiction movies. I mean, he, 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 he loves so many of them. Um, I mean, I definitely think that he would say that there's more concrete ideas in the literature and that there's a lot more fluff and fanfare in films around those concrete ideas. Yeah, well, I, I don't actually disagree with that particularly. I mean, I'm, I'm much more of a fan of uh, science fiction literature than movies, although I love the movies too. But I mean, uh, are there any books that uh, have influenced you guys that you've read or talk about? Not particularly. I'd say more, I, honestly, with Neil, I would say it, it's more uh, actual science. He's not a huge fiction reader. He is, he's, he's a science reader. He just loves reading, research, development, everything, everything. So, I mean, where does he get his science news from? Uh, glued to the internet. <laughs> but I, I have no idea what it is he's reading or where he's getting it or but but yeah, no, he's um he's an avid reader for any anything really that's science based. He he's one of those guys that you can kind of ask him about anything and he knows the latest stats and the latest research. My my daughter and I play a game of trying to find topics that we can throw at him and that he won't know something about the latest facts on it and it's uh it's tough. <laughs> we don't we can go we we'll go to some female places to try and come up with some topics and that's about our only place we can we can win. So I mean can you think of an example of some female topic that you got him on? <laughs> <laughs> uh, something I think I think we got him with ovulation. Something about ovulation. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it's very confusing. I, I admit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Then this other quote I wanted to ask you about is is uh, I, I've already said in a couple of places that basically he thinks humanity is doomed and that our only hope is <laughs> if we have if we <laughs> if we're ruled by benevolent AIs or humans who are genetically engineered to be better people than people now. Uh, what do you think about that idea? I, I think, like I said, he uh, he evolves, and and sometimes his more pessimistic views uh, change depending on his mood. And I would say he's definitely uh, views the world in a more positive place than when that quote came <laughs> out. But yes, we 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 can be polar opposites. I can have um, an alarming, sometimes to a fault, uh, rose-colored glasses on. Well, well, he sees things uh, in a different way than I do. But I'd, I'd definitely have to let him speak to that. <laughs> I refuse to see things that way. <laughs> I actually think that's a really interesting idea. So I don't know. I would I would be curious to see a movie with that premise. So just just yeah just yeah run, put in yeah. I think it's the it's the pessimistic uh, outlook that would definitely make the more interesting films. Um, all right, cool. So then, uh, what else are you working on? Uh, I, I've seen uh, rumors about District Ten and Terminus. Oh, yeah. Terminus was so long ago. Terminus was um, a short film that a friend of mine did, Trevor K. Wood. And we actually, I did write the feature for it, but um, I think we decided at the end of it that the budget for the budget for it and it was, it, we, it, we just thought it was, that was a better one to put in a drawer. I looked at it not too long ago and thought it was, it was I would have liked to have seen that film, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure it would have had the audience. And District 10 is always, 
it's, it's always a conversation and um, a treatment does exist that I love and I'd love to see on the screen one day badly. But, um, but it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you, you just don't know. It's a lot of people that have to agree on it. So. Well, I, I heard you talk about Terminus in an interview and it sounded kind of interesting. It's some sort of clay man or something like that. Still yeah, man. I actually really, lo- I actually really like the shorts online. At least I think it would still be online. It was a long time ago, but I actually really, I had a lot of fun writing that script too. Really got into, uh, I mean, it was a while ago now, but I really got into different personality types and, uh, and yeah, no, it's, but I just think considering that the, the character, the main character is just plagued by this cement creature that follows him around and, uh, nobody else sees it except he comes across this one little girl and she can see it too. And the story kind of unfolds from there. It's a different film. That's for sure. I don't think I can compare it to anything else out there, but, um, but yeah, maybe, may, maybe we were too hasty and throwing it in the drawer and it'll come back one day, but 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 there there it is. Well, it's still on your Wikipedia page, as if it's coming out next year or something. So, <laughs> is it really? Yeah, maybe Wikipedia I, uh, knows more more about it than you do. Yeah, yeah, no, Wiki, Wikipedia even has my wrong birth year, but I like the birth <laughs> year they choose, so I just leave it there. <laughs> uh, all right, then, like another thing I read in in Wired magazine, actually, uh, Neil said that he hopes to make a spectacular return to Johannesburg to buy a sort of skyscraper to live in uh, is that still <laughs> that comes uh... up that comes up it really does we um i mean it he loves johannesburg obviously he grew up there till he was 18 and uh the, the the cost of an apartment in vancouver you could buy some pretty amazing things in johannesburg um so yeah it, it comes up often but I, I, I don't know about the actual skyscraper but to have a home there would be would be i think pretty amazing all right, cool. So, uh, yeah, so I guess, um, I mean, we mentioned maybe District 10. Uh, is there anything else, uh, any other projects you're working on or just any other, anything else you want to mention? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually uh, looking to delve into television for a little bit, I think. I, uh, MRC, who, who did Elysium and Chappie, um, optioned a trilogy of books uh, a while back for me. Uh, and we're, we did wrote it up as a feature and then kind of, kind of at the time where it, it, the, the genre was a bit stale. And so we're revisiting it as a TV series. And I think in the next month or two, we might be shopping that around. And I've optioned a few, a few books that are local. I'm, I'm from Vancouver, Canada, and I really, um, I want to, I want to shoot something around Vancouver. And so I've optioned a few books that are set in Vancouver. Um, one even written by a Vancouver author that are just straight up character films, not, not science fiction at, at all. So I, kind of want to visit some, I'm one of those people that wants to write in every genre. So I think that uh, television or just straight up low, low, low budget character films may be my next. Well, Neil does Alien. Hmm. Uh, Yeah, well, and I heard you talk about that TV series. I think you said you had written all like four four seasons worth, or at least you knew what was going to happen. I I outlined. I I outlined. I've written the pilot and then, um, and, and then I've sketched out for I mean, the the books. There's a lot of it there. So um, for, yeah, but the, but there's four seasons ready to go when we go in with the pitch of what the the storylines would be. Well, that's good because I mean I won't mention any names, but there have been some TV series where they kind of do a couple of good seasons, and then it's obviously they don't know what they're where they're going to. Yeah, no, I, I I I totally and it, unfortunately in this one I actually feel like it gets stronger. Um. It, it, it gets it gets a little more uh yeah no it, it i the third and the fourth season are are the ones that i really want to get to so it may be a matter of revisiting things and making the first and second season as strong as the third and fourth but those are the ones that i'm really excited about it gets a little more game of thrones like in the in the third and the fourth season hmm. well, that sounds great i guess also I, i'll mention uh, you have a tea shop or something in vancouver you want to talk about that i do i do neverland tea salon and uh i opened that up so, well, I thought it would be opening up about six months before we started shooting Chappie, but things always take longer. I know that now. And uh, it opened up at the same time. So it, 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 was, it, was, a, it was a busy time. But um, yeah, the tea shop, and I also was just calling it a tea salon, but I realize now that it's actually a full-blown restaurant. And uh, I, I, I love it. I absolutely, that's probably why I want to shoot something in Vancouver now. I just, I, it's, it's just 
feels like pure creativity. We're always changing what's on the menu. We do high tea towers and we're constantly changing everything and everyone that works there is just so creative and excited by everything. We just got an uh, open table. We just uh, got in the top 10 restaurants overall in Vancouver, which was pretty exciting. So, so yeah, if anyone's in Vancouver, come check out Neverland. And so why did you decide to call it Neverland? Are you a big Peter Pan fan or? Um, you know, I, I, I look we're in our basement where we were each allowed to pick three posters to put on the movie wall. And uh, Peter Pan was one of mine. And that was before Neverland. So I guess Peter Pan was one. But mostly it was I found that uh, going for high tea with friends, to me, there was something like going back to your childhood. It was like tea parties. Like you just forget everything that you're worried about and all the stress and maybe it's the champagne you have with the high tea. I don't know. But there was something, I don't know, there was just something that for me, and I, and I watch it happen in Neverland every day. It's like it's everyone just, it, it's not that they're childlike in there, but they, they're definitely not stressed out and worried. So the, the never grow old thing to Neverland is, uh, is, it's an important part of the way I live life. And I just sort of wanted to create a place where people could go and check all their worries at the door and be like kids again. I mean, do you get a lot of writing done there? Is that a good environment to write in? Ha! No, that was the idea. It's like, oh, I'm going to sit in the corner and write. No, no. Um, when I've been really pressed and have to get something written, I have locked myself in the office and actually can write quite well. Or we're closed on Tuesdays. I call it Creative Tuesdays. And if I go in there and there's nobody in there and I'm by myself, it's the best place in the world for me to write. But anytime we're open, no. It's uh, one of the things I like about it is the sense of community. There's constantly people coming in I know to visit with. And as I'm sure you know, that's not very conducive to writing well. Uh, and then you said in your basement that you had you could put three posters on the wall. What were the other two? Uh, it was uh, Wizard of Oz and Twelve Monkeys. Oh, yeah. I love 12 Monkeys. Have you watched the TV series? You know what? I didn't even know it was coming out. And then the trailer came on and I started to watch it. And I turned it off right away because I knew that my life, the way my life was going to be with Chappie coming out and everything that I just wasn't going to get to watch it. So I haven't even read a review. I haven't looked at all because I am, I, I was literally so excited at the prospect so I'm going to dare to ask you, have you, is it, is it good? I, have, I haven't had a chance to watch it. No, to, uh, doing a, yeah, doing no, a podcast pretty... is a, is a pretty busy job too. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine. But no, I, I, I was blown away because I had no idea that they were even doing that, but it, it's, I think that's going to, it, it it's going to be tough to, I, I love that film. I absolutely love that film. Well, it's such a creepy film with such a dark ending too, though. I mean, that sounds like it's. Uh, no, I like that. <laughs> not terrible that's why i think i like that chappy to me it's like an r-rated fairy tale is because i don't i mean i i love the disney films too but i i like the darkness dark there there is darkness in life and there is light in life and the, i think the darkness and the tragedy in life makes the bright moments all the brighter so i don't know i think it's more i think it's more realistic even when it's not well, yeah, and you mentioned uh, reviews, and that makes me wonder, sort of, what kind of, have you been hearing responses to Chappie? Have you been hearing from fans, or just sort of what sort of feedback have you been getting on the movie? We have. Well, we, their reviews don't actually come out until tomorrow. So we see little, little sentences of the reviews, I guess, that are given to Sony ahead of time. And they, they do it by country. And they say, you know, good, fair, mixed, poor. And uh, I've, I've, I've been really happy with everything I've been reading. Um, I, I, I've got to wonder, though, it's like, what if they change their mind by the fourth? I don't know if they, <laughs> if they submit them and they can't change their mind. You know, sometimes you think about a film after a while and you change your mind. So from what I've been seeing so far, I am, I'm very optimistic and, and happy and excited about different people seem to be taking different themes and different things they like. So it's not the same response from everyone. There's a lot of diversity in there for good and for bad, which, which that, that makes me happy. Uh, and how about fan? Have you heard anything? Have any just like I don't know, friends or family or just ordinary people seen the movie? No, I mean we we they did test screenings and I'd sit in on the test screenings, which I found really really interesting. Um, but it's been a it, that it's been a while since that happened. Um, Hans Zimmer did the score after anybody has. In fact, nobody only we've seen it since the score got put in. 
So, no, tomorrow night at the premiere, our, we have tons of people here in New York that are coming to see it, and it'll be a first time. E- even our daughter has seen it for the first time tomorrow night. We've kept it pretty closed. So it'll be, uh, it'll be exciting. I remember the first time we showed District 9 to anybody was at Comic-Con. And that is a day I will never forget in my entire life. That was an amazing experience. So uh, I'm hoping, hoping it's as well received tomorrow night. Well, so why was that such an amazing experience, the District 9 premiere? It, it was just terrifying going in. Like we, District 9 is a strange film. It's like I could totally see if everyone thought we were insane and just hated it. Um, I, I feel like it could have gone so many different directions. Like, it's so hard to predict. So it was terrifying to sit down in that theater. And people, you know, you, you, I love watching a film with an audience because you feel everything that they're thinking, you know, when the laughter comes and the, and the gulps and when there's silence or when you hear people shuffling in their seats. I hate that moment. Um, so I think that, I mean, it was the first time I'd ever sat in a theater watching people watch my film. So that probably will always be a, a memorable experience. But I, th- I think tomorrow night will probably feel the same. Oh, I'm getting, uh, I'm getting scared even talking. To you. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you, you mentioned laughter. And I mean, uh, I, I understand that Chappie is more of a humorous movie. And so you sort of know if it's funny or not, because whether people are laughing or not, it can be a little hard yeah. to tell with a dramatic movie. The middle, the middle part of Chappie is hilarious. I have no doubts that people are going to laugh at the middle part. It, it is, it just, it's just funny. And every test audience we watched it with, and we really didn't ever change the middle. Uh, they've always, always laughed, always laughed. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not worried about the humor in it. I think, I think it's funny. I think that most people, I'm not sure my grandma would find it funny, but I, I think I worry about her seeing it. Um, but I think uh, I, I, I think pretty much everyone's gonna, going to going to laugh at parts for sure. Well, yeah, didn't you say you you took your mom to District Nine and there's all this swearing and you were kind of like I, I didn't write that. Yeah, no, no, that was both my grandmas went to it, not with me. And one of one of my grand one of my grandmas is kind of deaf, so it was okay. <laughs> she didn't really know. And the other grandma was like, "Why did you have to have all that swearing in it?" I was like, "That was Shalto grandma. He improved all the swear words." <laughs> 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 but there's a lot of swearing in this film too, and uh, and also uh, Ninja and Yolandi decorated their own lair. And Ninja drew penises everywhere. So <laughs> there's penises all over their <laughs> lair. And I'm just waiting for that. My, my, my other grandma's passed away, but the one that's kind of deaf, she's going to see those penises. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not looking forward to that conversation at all. <laughs> uh, okay, so Terry, so uh, we're all out of time. But uh, yeah, I mean, I want to wish you the best of luck with the movie. And I hope the premiere tomorrow night goes really, really well. I'm really, as I said, I'm really looking forward to seeing it. Oh, thank you. I hope I hope you like it. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I'll laugh. I'm and sure watch, I'll for laugh <laughs> watch for those penises. Watch for those penises on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Yes. So, so we've been speaking with Terry Tatchell. This new movie it's called Chappie uh, in theaters March sixth. So uh, Terry, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks a lot. Really, really good talking to you today. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to Terry Tatchell for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to everyone who signed up this week to support us on Patreon. And their names are Jessica Wolf, Elizabeth Lee, Jason Anderson, Ian Cassell, Naomi Malay, Rob Tyrell, Ramsey Shahada, Thomas Schwendeman, Anthony Cardno, E.M. Hammock, Travis Johnson, Patrick Fisher, and Kurt Donaldson. Our current total is $158.64 per episode. And remember that if we reach $250 per episode, that'll guarantee that the show continues through the end of 2015. And if we reach $400 per episode, that'll guarantee that the show continues through June of 2016. So if you're looking forward to another year or more of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. So that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time or fixed monthly contribution, you can do that over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And I'd like to give a very special thank you to Neil Easterbrook, who just made a $100 contribution, and to Daniel Bahula, who just made a $30 contribution. So a huge thanks again to all our supporters. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. 
The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkertley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.